You're watching a global celebration of all things Notre Dame, where we invite you to watch, connect, give, and vote. This is Notre Dame Day, live from the LaFortune Student Center. Welcome to Notre Dame Day. If you're just joining us for the very first time, welcome to our 22. 22. I think wow. Taylor Swift has a song. 22. 20, I think she yeah. does too. Yeah, mm -hmm. po popular for this. But hour, I don't think I guess. she would sing for 22 straight hours. I don't know if she would. We should have given her a call, I guess. <laughs> she loves Notre Dame. She's been she here does. before. She's been yeah. on the sidelines. I Which, think her sister goes here. Yeah, well, some sibling. I some believe. sibling. Yeah. 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 yeah oh, it might be a brother. I'm not sure. Brother. A sibling. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. Well, this is 22 in 29 hours of global celebrations for the University of Notre Dame. Now, if you're a regular viewer, thank you. Of course, we promise you that this hour telecast telecast will not disappoint. My name is Emily Pritchard. For the next hour, I will be one of your co-hosts for the very first Notre Dame Day celebration. Of course, I am here at the Fortune Student Center on the Notre Dame campus, just a few yards away, of course, from the university's main building and the iconic Golden Dome. Now, this will be our broadcast headquarters for the next eight hours as we celebrate all things Notre Dame with students, alumni, parents, friends, and, of course, fans all around the world. Now, I am delighted to be joined by my co-host today, Jack Nolan. Jack, thanks for joining us. I'm delighted to be back. Did three hours last night and yeah. had such a good time. I'm back, and this is going so well. Next year, let's do 48. Yeah. As all the staff is glaring at me right now, I am happy to be with you at the Notre Dame Day Anchor Desk as well. Now, in this hour, we will learn more about one of the many ways Notre Dame serves the South Bend community, and we'll talk with a Notre Dame expert about the canonizations of Pope John the 23rd and Pope John Paul the Second. And we will have live residence hall challenges between Lewis Hall and Lions Hall right here on campus and online. But right now. We would like to get this hour started. We will begin with a live remote with our Notre Dame Day reporter, Claire Rembecki, who is three blocks from the Notre Dame campus at the Robinson Community Learning Center. Claire. Claire Thank you, you Jack. Good. I'm here at the Robinson Community Learning Center. I'm joined here. Okay. I'm joined here today by the founding manager, Jay Caponegro, and the current manager, who is Jennifer Nat Budere, here to talk about the Robinson Community Learning Center and some of the work they're doing with the community. Thank you guys for joining us on Notre Dame Day. So, thank you. So, how did the idea for the Robinson Community Learning Center begin, Jay? Well, back in 2000, Father Malloy was very engaged in the community, and so... As he looked around in the Northeast neighborhood, he noticed that there was an opportunity for the university to better relate to its neighbors. And so in 2001, we opened up the Robinson Community Learning Center, named after a woman who had been very involved in the, in the community, the Northeast neighborhood of South Bend, for all her life. So we were very pleased that we were able to open a center to bring Notre Dame students and faculty and staff into a better relationship with our neighborhood. And that's really what our mission has been ever since 2001, is focusing on building positive relationships in the community while enhancing learning opportunities for both the community members and our Notre Dame students. Uh, it's great to be here on ND Day because we've had, over, we've had clearly thousands of Notre Dame students come through here since 2001 when I was director. Uh, I'm very pleased that they continue to come through, as you can see today. Um, under our new manager, Jennifer Nepudere. Jennifer, what are some of the programs that the Robinson Center is currently working with? Okay. Well, the program that you see all around you is our um, after-school tutoring and enrichment program. So we serve about 70 children from the local neighborhood, and they get an hour of tutoring every day combined with a variety of enrichment opportunities. And there are about 130 Notre Dame students that come down here and work with their child every day all year, so they get a chance to develop some really strong relationships. What are some of the other programs you're involved? I know there's a Lego robotics program, there's a Shakespeare program. Do you want to talk about those a little bit? Yes, we have lots of programs. Um, well, actually, if you look in the corner, you'll notice there's a big rack of clothing there, and those are actually our costumes for our upcoming production of Twelfth Night by the Robinson Shakespeare Company. And that involves about um, 35 kids, grades 3 through 12, and they produce two Shakespeare plays a year, fully staged, um, and compete in the um, Shakespeare monologue competitions. Um, we also... Um, host a range of other programs. The Take 10 program is one of the ones where we have our widest outreach. That's a violence prevention conflict resolution program. Um, the curriculum was developed here in Notre Dame and it's delivered in 17 local schools and agencies by, again, Notre Dame student volunteers, about 130, that go out and they teach in the classes once a week um, throughout the course of the year. 
So um, let's see, other programs, we have a youth entrepreneurship program where middle and high school students get the opportunity to um, develop their entrepreneurial ideas and they create an elevator pitch and then a full business plan that they present in a competition and they get to work with mentors from the business school. So they get some really good advice along the way and they have their own business that we run with the kids, which is Robinson Center Football Parking. So anyone who's coming out for a game day should plan to park here at the center and our youth will give you wonderful customer service. Uh, we also have a Lego robotics team, and uh, we won the Indiana State Championship the year before last. So they got to travel to Germany to compete in the European Lego Open Championship. <laughs> the European Championship. But, uh, okay. Well, thank you, Jay. Thank you, Jennifer, for joining us on this day. I mean, I don't think it's possible to overstate the work you do here. It's fantastic. We'll, we'll go back to North stuff with Notre Dame Day. So, Emily, I'm going to send it back to you in the studio. Thank you so much, Claire. Well, we are joined now by Notre Dame professor Kathleen Sprose Cummings. Thank you so much for joining us, You're who welcome. is here to talk with us all about the canonizations in Rome yesterday of Pope John the 23rd and Pope John Paul II. Now, Professor Cummings is an associate professor of American Studies at Notre Dame and the director of the university's Kushwa Center for the Study of American Catholicism. Now, her teaching and research center on the history of women and American religion and the study of U.S. Catholicism. Now, two former popes were actually canonized by Pope Francis yesterday during a 10 a.m. public mass in St. Peter's Square. And, you know, what is the meaning of that? Canonizations are always grand events in the Catholic Church, but it's hard to match yesterday's. Four popes, a total of four popes participating in one way or another in the ceremony. What happened yesterday was that John Paul II and John XXIII were canonized, declared saints by the Church. What that means is it, it doesn't make them saints, it, it confirms that they've been in heaven from the moment of their deaths. So while as Catholics we believe that any person in heaven is a saint, only canonized saints have had that process certified by the church. And what does it mean to have two canonized on the very same day? It's unprecedented. There's never been a double papal canonization before, and we're unlikely to see one again. I think. Um, Pope Francis, it tells us as much about Pope Francis as it does about the two men that were elevated to the altars of sainthood. Pope Francis was interested in, as he's, he's demonstrated to us in so many ways over the last year, he's focused on healing divisions within the church. And for better or for worse, it's not entirely accurate, but John the 23rd is seen as a hero to more progressive Catholics, while John Paul II is seen as one to more conservative Catholics. And Pope Francis has said in other contexts that it's time to bring these factions of the church together. And canonization is, uh, can always be a, a, a highly symbolic act, and that's what he was doing in linking those two men. And where do you do you think the focus was more on the two pope, former popes that were being canonized or on Pope Francis? You know, where were people maybe focusing more? Well, Pope Francis has shown that he, he, he can draw a crowd. Um, but I think most of the people there were there for the people being canonized. You know, the first canonization I went to was in fall 2010 when Brother Andre Bassett, the first saint from the Congregation of Holy Cross, was canonized. And it's really an amazing experience. People cheer and they weep. It's a little bit like a sporting event, but yet it's also a very solemn occasion. So you could see in the crowd yesterday, there were people waving flags and cheering wildly. How long does um, a mass like that last? Or how long does the process last for us? Have oh, well, the mass, <laughs> the mass uh, lasts for about two hours, but people start lining up hours and hours beforehand because it's really hard to get a seat. So it truly is like <laughs> sitting out, waiting for tickets to maybe your favorite it sporting kind event. Of, it kind of is, yes, in a lot of ways. And so many pilgrims had traveled to Rome for this event, particularly from Poland. Um, to honor John Paul II, and people were sleeping out in the square. They had lined up for hours. And then I know we're here at Notre Dame today. Yeah. Is there any Notre Dame connections to what happened over the weekend? Notre Dame connections to what? Well, in a sense, uh, it tells us an awful lot about American Catholicism, and Notre Dame is, is connected to American Catholicism. I think that it, um, you know, our founder, our founder, not our founder at Notre Dame, but the founder of the Congregation of Holy Cross, Basil Moreau, his cause is reportedly very close. And I suspect that when that happens, that'll be a big Notre Dame celebration. Unfortunately, the process remains kind of secret until it, right at the end. So I don't have any inside information on that. But um, rumor has it that Basil Moreau is very close. And like the celebration for Brother Andre Bissett, uh, it'll be a big one. And I was going to ask, what is the process of canonization? Mm. How, how does this come about? Mm. Well, it's interesting. 
interesting. Both of the men canonized yesterday. Um, it would have been possible that we would have never had that moment. What I mean by that is that after both, after each died, after John the 23rd died in 1963 and John Paul II in 2005, there were proposals to canonize them immediately. Santo subito in Italian, sainthood now. Let's bypass the process and just declare them a saint. Um, in both cases, their successors decided to go through with the process, although it went rather quickly with John Paul II. Um, rather quickly, but all the steps were followed. In the case of John the 23rd, his second authenticated miracle was waived. Pope Francis decided to do that. Um, what, what the process is, it's a detailed investigation of everything that the candidate wrote, everything that uh, witnesses are interviewed about their virtues, their heroic virtues, and then the Vatican's Congregation for the Causes of the Saints verifies that they live lives of heroic sanctity and they're declared venerable. Then it's time to wait for miracles. And for us here in the U.S. that maybe watched yeah. on TV or online or just read a few articles yeah. about it, you know, what does it mean to be able to witness this in our own time setting to see these two former popes canonized on, on the same date? It means, first of all, anytime anyone is canonized, it's, a, it's an occasion to celebrate that um, in canonizing someone, it doesn't mean that they were perfect or without sin, but it means that they did the best that they could and that they're in heaven. And that's a reminder for all of us that it's possible. If it's possible for them, it's possible for us. But I think, too, um, it tells us a lot about the last 50 years. We celebrate next year the closing of the Second Vatican Council, and it was the Pope Pope John XXIII, who called the Second Vatican Council, and then John Paul II, who implemented it in so many ways. So it was really a very momentous event from the perspective of uh, Catholics in the United States, but really around the world. And I know you said you're currently writing a book, I believe, as well. Yes. If you can talk about that yeah. some and what it's about. Sure. I'm writing a book called Citizen Saints, Catholics and Canonization in America. And what it's about is that when you look at people who are canonized, as I said earlier, it tells you a little bit more about the people who are promoting the saint than it does about the man or woman actually being canonized. So when we look at the saints who have been popular in the United States, like the, like Francis Cabrini, the first saint um, ca canonized from the United States in 1946, immigration was very important um, at that time, and it was a way to celebrate the United States immigrant heritage. John Paul II canonized more saints than all of his predecessors combined. He believed that there should be as many saints as possible because he understood that when you canonize someone, from a population within the church that doesn't have a saint yet, um, it's very meaningful. And U.S. Catholics in 1946 were elated to have their first saint. Now, interestingly, John XXIII beatified Elizabeth Ann Seton in March of 1963. It was one of his last acts before his death. And uh, interpreters at that time described the event as the ecclesiastical equivalent of John Kennedy's election. In other words, Catholics had arrived. They had a Catholic president and a canonized saint. And just from your perspective, looking mm. at the weekend, what do you think looking back at that and that celebration mm. happening? Well, it was a very emotional moment when the two popes embraced. Um, there was a lot of question leading up to it. Was Benedict going to attend? What would it mean if he attended? Was he going to be well enough to attend? Would Pope Francis mention him in the homily? A lot of questions. And I think at that moment when they embraced, um, it was really meaningful and um, really just united um, it, five decades of church history in one moment. It was really very moving. Professor Cummings, thank you so much You're for welcome. joining us here on this Notre Dame Day. How do you plan on spending the rest of yours <laughs> this afternoon? I'm going to listen and just enjoy. It's a great lineup. Yeah, it's been wonderful here for us. Okay. And thank you again You're for welcome. joining us. And of course, from time to time during our Notre Dame Day celebration, we are showing you some interesting videos that showcase Notre Dame in some very special ways, including many of the very best of the fighting for ads that have aired on NBC during their broadcast of Notre Dame's home football games. And now let's watch one. Check it out. My ancestors were brought here as slaves, and I grew up under apartheid where the color of one's skin still determined the value of one's life. I spoke out against it and was thrown in jail. In prison, there was people of different religious backgrounds, Christians, Muslims, Jews, and during this very difficult times when we were being tortured, we used to share with each other prayers. For me, that was a sign that God's spirit dwells in all of us. 
and it made me believe that one of the ways of fighting apartheid was not merely to cross cultural divides, but also religious divides. After his release from prison in 1976, Rashid Omar became an interfaith leader in the nonviolent struggle against apartheid. Our country nearly did go up in flames. And it is due to people like Rashid that we pulled back from the edge of the precipice. Today, Rashid Omar continues his work as an interreligious peace builder, both as a Muslim imam in his native South Africa and as a peace study scholar at the University of Notre Dame's Kroc Institute. What I try to impart to my students is that there's no way that a peace builder can go out into the world without understanding how religion contributes towards conflict and violence. And more importantly, how religion also can be a resource for building peace. The University of Notre Dame asks, what would you fight for? Fighting for peace among religions. We are the Fighting Irish. And joining us now here in our studio is Dr. Emily Block, a professor in the Mendoza College of Business and the program director of Business on the Front Lines. Thanks for stopping by, Emily. Thanks for having me. Now, we just chatted a little <laughs> bit. I think people are going to be surprised what Business on the Front Lines actually is. Tell us about the program. You know, we started this program uh, six years ago as a partnership between the Mendoza College of Business and Catholic Relief Services. And since then, we have had 21 groups of students working in 18 different countries, really looking at ways to explore the role of business in rebuilding post-war economies, doing projects with Catholic Relief Services, who's our partner on the ground. What inspired the creation of this program? You know, it was the brainchild of Professor Viva Barkas, who is a professor in the management department, as well as on the CRS board, and Dr. Carolyn Wu, um, looking for ways that business could contribute to leveraging and uh, building uh, markets and opportunities for uh, young men and women to build livelihoods for themselves as they recover from war. Now, how do you determine which countries you visit? You know, it, that we have an internal vetting process with Catholic Relief Services. Um, we try to make sure that the countries are um, stable enough so that our students will be safe. We trust our security to CRS. Um, we also want to make sure that the projects are within our wheelhouse, things that we can do very well, you know, um, value chain analyses or uh, agricultural projects that we can really contribute and make a difference so that the projects can live on. So what are some of your future destinations? You know, we're still deciding. Um, next year we are hoping to perhaps, perhaps be in East Timor, Timor-Leste or mm -hmm. Myanmar. Um, we've been invited to go back to Cambodia and to Rwanda. so. Um, hopefully we'll be able to get some projects there. Now, some might say that these can be scary places. You know, I think statistically you're probably in as much danger driving to the grocery store. Uh, but also, I think that if you have good local partners on the ground, which we do in Catholic Relief Services, second largest international aid organization in the world, um, they know the people and they know where we should be and who should we should talk to. and. Uh, you know, we, we just keep our wits about us. Now, what are some of the ways when the students are there and on the ground, what do they specifically do to make an impact? Well, the projects are really co-produced between Catholic Relief Services staff and our students themselves. And our students are really good at gathering information, at doing, at tracing the market value of a product or a crop, for example, across an entire value chain, or look for opportunities for export, or perhaps some opportunities for corporations and NGOs to find mutual value creation and work together. What are some of the obstacles you've had to overcome? It is... Uh, you know, it's really difficult problem solving in uncertain environments. Our students are asked to be incredibly adaptive and responsive to the changing circumstances. We've had to change countries at the last minute, you know. We were going to Lebanon one year and, and we ended up in Uganda. We were in Uganda and then the LRA and then we, oops, ended up in Kenya, you know, just, they're asked to roll with it. And, and I think it really creates some good opportunities for our students to engage in real world uncertainty, problem solving on the ground. You told me you've been here now for six years here mm -hmm. at the University of Notre Dame. Is there a story from this program that really stands out in your mind? Oh gosh, you know, there are so many great stories. Uh, I, 
what was most interesting, one of the greatest stories that I have is uh, the work that we did in Cambodia this year. We were working on a childhood nutrition program and just we got to share meals and live in a village and, and cook with a family and really understand some of the livelihood challenges around nutrition and just seeing the ability and the human dignity associated with a good day's work and how that has the ability to transform people's lives. Um, it's really just a collection of individual stories when you look in someone's face and you get to see the joy that they have when they get to have the opportunity to really build their livelihoods for their children. And, that, and that's just the best feeling. I appreciate you coming by. This is another example. I did three hours last night. I've been watching throughout the day. People know Notre Dame for its sports teams. Mm -hmm. They know it's a great academic university. Mm -hmm. But Notre Dame Day is really starting to show people what Notre Dame does mm -hmm. with students, even mm -hmm. before they graduate, in terms of making an impact, not just in this country or around this campus, but all around the world. Absolutely. And we have the best students. Uh, we have Mendoza students, Croc Peace Study students, Globe students, law school students, and we get the cream of the crop here at Notre Dame in the MBA program, and we're really excited to give them opportunities to do meaningful and, and, and work that challenges them. Uh, Emily, thank you for coming by. Thanks for having Thanks me. Thanks what you do. That was a pleasure. When we come back, I will be talking with a guy from the world of sports who's a huge Notre Dame fan, NASCAR driver, Todd Bodine. But now, uh, let's welcome, uh, well, right now we're going to go and, and take a look at a video. People everywhere are the same. They just want a chance to make tomorrow better than today. Serving in Iraq in the 101st Airborne, I experienced this firsthand as we were able to convince insurgents to put down their weapons in favor of jobs. When my service was complete, I looked for a business school where the emphasis on the bottom line was for others, not just myself. Keith Flatley is a graduate of Notre Dame's Mendoza College of Business and a former student in the school's Business on the Front Lines course, which examines commerce's role in rebuilding war-torn societies. Keith was a part of that first Business on the Front Lines team. In 2008, they traveled to Bosnia. They spent time with people in Sarajevo and Srebrenica and were really moved by their suffering. When we got to Bosnia, we learned firsthand about the civil war and the ethnic cleansing that took place. These people had been let down by everyone. They didn't get help during the war. They didn't get help much after the war. And you realize you can do something, and you can do it right now. In partnership with Catholic Relief Services, Keith and his classmates created an economic development model that eases the path for refugees to return and start businesses. Now a vice president of business development at Precision Partners in Chicago, Keith Flatley continues to work with the people of Bosnia, dedicating his free time to consult with local entrepreneurs. Through the sustained commitment that Keith and the University of Notre Dame have shown, together we've been able to impact lives at a moment when the people of Bosnia-Herzegovina needed most. The University of Notre Dame asks, what would you fight for? Fighting to rebuild communities. We are the Fighting Irish. And now, as promised, let's welcome to Notre Dame Day an athlete who has 37 career wins in his NASCAR racing career. His fans know him as the Onion for his bald head. On our telephone line right now from North Carolina, I know he's been watching all day. Please welcome Todd Bodine. Todd, how you doing? I'm doing wonderful, Jack. How you doing? I'm doing very, very well. And I've had the pleasure of meeting you and your lovely wife on many occasions. Uh, but I'm not going to give away the answer uh, to this story because, again, the first time I met you uh, was actually at a monogram club reception in Notre Dame Stadium before a football game. And, and this was the question I had and lots of folks have. How did you become such a big fan of Notre Dame? <laughs> well, I, I became a fan by marriage, actually. Um, my wife and, and her family are huge Notre Dame fans. Um, had a one of her nieces actually graduated Notre Dame, and uh, they've got, I think they said they got five priests in their family, so it's, uh, uh, when, you're, when you're around their household, it's all about Notre Dame. You know, I, I grew up in upstate New York, 
And uh, from the time I was born, I was uh, in racing. Our father owned a racetrack for 25 years. So it, I was about race cars and motorcycles and go-karts. I, I never really followed sports, uh, even professional sports. I never really was involved. And college sports, just I, I never knew anything about it. And when I got with my wife and, and uh, saw what Notre Dame meant to so many people, I was intrigued and, and uh, very, very happily became a Notre Dame fan. And your schedule is still very, very difficult. Like most drivers, you're very skilled at racing many different vehicles. I know you're still racing in the NASCAR Truck Series, but you've also discovered what most great athletes discover. It's a heck of a lot easier sitting on this side of the camera than actually going out and doing it. You've become a TV commentator as well. Yeah, I have, uh, and I enjoy it too. You know, I, I'm winding down in my career. I mean, I, I have to realize that uh, you know i can't race forever can't drive forever i turned 50 this february so uh, it's time to start looking at other careers and you know i love the sport of racing uh and i've been very fortunate to make a lot of friends and a lot of those friends are in the tv side of it and i was fortunate enough last year um, to be asked to do the the booth commentating at the iowa race for the truck series and i went out there and did it uh, learned a lot enjoyed it and I must have done okay because they asked me to come do some more. And uh, this spring in Daytona, I did a, a pre-race show, an hour-long pre-race show, and, and learned a lot and enjoyed it. So we're we're looking down that path, you know. But uh, I'm still I'm still not retired. I still want to race. I still can race. We we just have to get some sponsorship and some funding. You know, these uh, NASCAR vehicles are very expensive to race around the track, and uh, we got to have some some funding from a great corporate sponsor and partner, and uh, that's what we're trying to do right now. We're looking for that that partner. I know your buddy Mark Martin's been proven in recent years that uh, age is relative if you still have the skills. I know you do, but with your busy schedule, how do you find time to follow the Fighting Irish? <laughs> well, it's it's not difficult. Uh, you know, we don't. The problem is we don't get to go to a lot of games. Um, you know, if we're lucky, we can get to two a year. Uh, most of the time we've been, been able to make one, um, but, you know, it, it is difficult, and uh, we, we really have to plan it out. Uh, if we, we know what the schedule is, obviously, of, of the racing, and we look at the football schedule, and we just plan it out, and we always try to make at least one, and, and we like to make it a home game. I mean, we've been to a, a couple of away games. Actually, we went to Wake Forest uh, and watched the Irish play, I think it was two years ago, because uh, Wake Forest is literally an hour from our house, so we made it to that game. But, you know, we like to make it a home game, come up and, and be on the campus and, and experience uh, the Notre Dame uh, tradition. I mean, when you, it, it's really impressive to me uh, to, to step foot on the campus and walk through the campus. You really get to feel the, the, the sense of the tradition and the history uh, that surrounds Notre Dame and not only the football, but the, the, the college in general. It's just, it's an incredible experience when you step on that campus. And uh, that's one thing we like to do every year is, is get up there. We've got, we've made, I've been very fortunate to make some friends at Notre Dame. Uh, uh, my wife is a, a three-time breast cancer survivor, so we've got to be friends with Pocky Kelly. And uh, she is actually, my wife is doing some work with the, the Kelly's Care Foundation, and so we've become friends with them. And uh, Chad and Lisa Quender and, uh, Pete Chivarelli and some other folks up there. We just, we really enjoy it. It's it's a it's the one thing about Notre Dame that is impressive. It is such a big family, and it's uh, it's great to be a part of it. We got to get you to uh, the Kelly Cares Gala in uh, in New York. Uh, they just had it this past week. That's a heck of a event as well. I know you would enjoy that. Now, when can Notre Dame fans expect to see you behind the wheel again? Well, we're, we're working on some full-time sponsorship for the truck series. Um, we haven't got anything really to announce on that yet, but we've got a lot of uh, great things happening. Uh, but right now we are going to run a, a nationwide series car in Dover, Delaware. I believe it's in about a month's time, um, actually maybe three weeks' time. Uh, so that will be the next time we'll be behind the wheel. It's uh, uh, trying to, to help a friend. You know, it's not a full-time position by any means. It's uh, a great guy that needs some help, and I'm just stepping in to, to 
get to go in some circles and have some fun. Well, Todd, thanks for taking the time. We literally have viewers all around the world, so I think you have a bunch more Notre Dame NASCAR fans on your team after this appearance, and I look forward to seeing you again this fall. All right, Jack, I appreciate it, and go Irish. All right, good luck in your next race. Now let's take you back outside to Alyssa Marino on the North Quad, where they are getting ready to begin our next residence hall competition. Thanks, Jack. Well, I'm here on the North Quad with what was supposed to be a tug-of-war match between Lewis and Lions Hall, but Lions Hall didn't show up. So these Lewis ladies won by default. There's feathers flying, they're singing, there's dancing. Very spirited group of girls. I'm here with Hannah, who's going to tell me a little bit about how it feels to just win for your hall. Winning's great. I mean, our dorm is highly competitive, so any chance we get to show our spirit and come out and win something, it's just a great feeling, and we're just feeling pretty good about ourselves right now, coming on top of Lions. Like, obviously, they're a little scared to show up and compete with us. <laughs> Okay, but you still have a game of tug of war to play. You're going to go against our develop mean, development team over here. Any last words you guys want to say to them before you take them on? All I can say is I hope they've been hitting the weight room lately because they're going to need it. These feathers are strong. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get you ladies in place. Okay, so as they get into place, I'm going to go through the rules here. The girls can have as many as 18 players on their end of the rope, and they'll have no more than three minutes to show their superior strength. Okay, when I say go, we're all gonna go. Ready, go! right there and I'm gonna send it back into you guys now for competition number two back to you Emily thank you so much Alyssa well a little louder out there for you than it is for us inside but I am now joined by two ladies from Lewis Hall welcome guys so much inside now you're ready for a little competition right we're ready and uh, what ready. we're gonna be doing today I don't know if you've ever heard of a new app it's called heads up have you guys played it before yes you have, have. You have not. All right, so we got one okay. experienced, one non-experienced. <laughs> well, Ellen DeGeneres made it famous on her show. Basically, we've got a two-person team. Works a little bit like charades. They'll put some clues on their heads. If they get it right, they'll throw that iPad down and get one point. If they want to pass, they'll throw it up. They get 60 seconds, and we'll see uh, how good you guys go. So you guys ready? Yes, we are. All right, well, let's get ready there. We'll pass the mic off. Until we hit play. play. You are going to hit play, yep, and 60 seconds will come up. All right, let's flip it just the other way and we'll be ready to go there. All right, and we're getting ready and count down to three, two, and one. Oh, um, the orange men's dorm on Mod Pod. Not. Sweet dear Lord. Um, the bus. Uh, O'Neal? No, the no. bus, the NFL player. Oh, um, Jerome Bettis. Yes. Um, the really old guy at the top of the library. Oh, Father Hesper. Great clue. Um, uh, the Jack is named after Purcell. The, is named after this guy. Joyce. Um, oh, what's the name of the big collage on the library? I don't know. Pass. Back. Oh, sorry. Oh, oh, close. Okay, Marlo Thomas's husband. Oh, I forget. Pass. Back. A little harder. There you go. Oh, the place where we light candles. The grotto. Okay. Um, next to Keenan. Uh, Stanford. Um, oh, the guy who played football and baseball right before we came in. Pass. Um, pass. Um, oh. Good. All right, okay. time's up Coming. there. Looks like these ladies, six points six for you all. How do you feel about that? Six points. Pretty good. We'll Not see, so bad. We'll At least you showed up, right, on, like, your friends over there to tug of war, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, they didn't think my joke was good there. That's all right. <laughs> well, um, what, how are you guys going to be spending the rest of your Notre Dame day? Getting ready for finals. Get finals. There you go. A little fun with heads up. Now on to finals. Well, yep. thank you guys for joining thank us so you. much. I believe we do have Lions Hall here, right, for our next round of heads up. We're going to be passing the mics and doing a little swap out here. So they, too, will get 60 seconds to compete here with the game of heads up. So we'll have you guys switch. Thank Thanks you. so much for joining us.
And of course, you saw them demonstrate there that Heads Up app made famous by Ellen DeGeneres. Now you can hear a little bit the live crowd out there on the North Quad. Of course, a little commotion going on out there. The competition is always tough, and we're bringing it back in here for another round of Heads Up. How are you guys doing today? Good. If you guys can introduce yourselves to all your Notre Dame fans out there. Um, I'm Casey Gross. I'm Sarah Motter. And you are from which hall? Lions. Lions Hall. And in here to uh, maybe defend yourselves a little bit. You guys didn't make it to tug of war. What happened? Um, a lot of girls in class and oh, work class. during this yeah. time. Work and finals. Time. It's coming yeah. up, I guess. Well, that's all right. You're here for heads up. So you have you guys played before? No. No. That's all right. First time for everything. Are you guys ready? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. All right. Cool. If you are ready, we'll get the game going. Yep. You're on right side up. And the countdown's going to three, two, and one. Um, babes. BP. Yep. Um, football coach. Um, Brian Kelly. Older than that. Ch uh, Kelly Rudy, Rudy football coach. Devan Dan Devine. Uh, before that. De mm. Pass. Pass. Um, our dorm. Lions. Yep. Uh, pass. Uh, basketball player, women's, not Skylar Diggins. Really, uh, really good. Kayla McBride? Um, no, older. Ruth Riley? Yep. Um, past president, Monk. Molloy. Yep. Um, president of the United States, he was, uh, he was in the movie Newt Rockne, All American. Uh, round three. Yep. Um, Louis Nix's nickname. Irish Chocolate. Yep. Um, not South Quad, the other quad. North Quad. Yep. Um, oh, fall, they're getting up um, there. Dorma, North Quad. Farley. Yep. Eight. All right. These two ladies, eight points, which, of course, is tying, I think, our best score of the day. We had a few guys get eight points earlier. How does it feel Get up, getting up to eight? Yeah. We did good. First time at Heads Up. What did you think of the game? Not bad. Pretty fun. Held our, we held our own. a little bit after our <laughs> North Quad lack of showing. That's so. all right. That's all right. Now you just are a heads up experience. You can take that, yeah. take that yeah. farther in life, I'm Going sure. Going for nine next year. Nine next year. And uh, how are you guys <laughs> spending the rest of your Notre Dame day today? Um, well, Lions Hall soccer is in the, uh, semi or the finals tonight. So, like, that's no. a big deal for us. Yeah. yeah. Brady Quinn and Outside later. or inside? Outside. Uh, yeah, outside. Uh, weather permitting. Weather could be yep. interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, great. Good luck with that later. Thank, and thank you so you much, so much for joining us today. Nice it's been day. tons of fun. Well, and of course, now we are not stopping our live coverage just yet. Right now, we are going to our social media command center. That's where everything's happening from Facebook, Twitter, and everything you want to know on social media for Notre Dame Day. Right now, let's head to Alyssa Marino at the Notre Dame Command Center. Hey, Alyssa. Hey, Emily. Thanks. We're here at the Social Media Command Center. I'm here with Lyndall and Mark and Dan. They're going to kind of walk me through what's going on here. Lyndall, I'll give you the mic first. Okay. Thank you. Um, thanks for joining us here in the lounge. It's getting very exciting. We have a lot of students coming in saying thank you at our photo booth. If you're by La Fortune, please stop by. Please say hi. We have snacks. Um, right now, I'm going to take you and show you the number one thing you need to know, and that's NorderDameDay.nd.edu. Log on now, you can um, look at our leaderboards, see how the challenge fund competition is going, look at the residence hall challenges, view our broadcast schedule, see when you might wanna tune in, and most importantly, you can give and you can vote. Look for the big green button, you can't miss it, it's on the very home, the front of the homepage here. Um, log on, we have over 350 areas of the university that you can choose. You can make your donation, choose where you wanna cast your votes, and help those programs and those areas win uh, a portion of our challenge funds. Now I'm gonna hand it over to Mark, and he's gonna show you some of the things that are, have been going on over the past hour. Great, thank you, Lyndall. All right, let's go into the social space, see what's been happening. I was checking out Notre Dame football's uh, Twitter feed, and I noticed something quite curious. So we thought we'd bring in an expert to help us explain what might be happening. So I've got Chris Jan with me here. Chris Jan is the, uh, the social media manager for Fighting Irish Athletics accounts, and she's going to try to explain what Notre Dame football may be trying to do here to try to win this competition. Chris Jan? Thank you so much. Well, a couple of months ago, uh, Student Welfare and Development started this whole concept of Irish on three. And so every time some student athletes go to a different student athlete sport, they hashtag it Irish on three and they get some points. So what I suspect here is you look at the, uh, you go in, we're doing Irish on three. And so football is trying to say, hey, look, there are so many wonderful things that our other teams are doing. We already get a vote. Take your vote two and your vote three and vote for our other, for our other student athletes who we you know, care about and who are our friends. 
So as you can see, there's uh, tweets going on about every single sport that we have here and telling you why it's worthwhile to send your ND Day votes their way. Great, thanks for that explanation. A few more things I wanted to cover with you as we go through. We've still got our pick wall up here, some exciting stuff going on. We had some good tug of war going with Welsh Family Hall earlier on. Uh, the photo booth is still going on in the media room here. So if you want to come in, grab a funky hat, a boa, sit down with a sign, get your video and pictures taken. It's a lot of fun, and we will give you the free snacks. On top of that, Twitter seems to be getting us some really good activity. So Casey Spreen tweeted, Lewis chicks are getting pumped up for ND Day and will be taking on Lions Hall at 4 p.m. These chicks are ready, feathers and all. And if you've been watching the broadcast, you saw that's true. They came out in their feathers. They were decked out. They were excited to, to win both the tug of war and try to win the uh, spirit contest as well. Then we've got the ND grad school. All students go to the ND Day social media room in La Fortune, first floor Soren room, to say thanks to an advisor or family. So come on in, say your thanks. Now I'm about to turn you over to Dan Santucci. He's going to walk you through some of the things that are going on in our leaderboard. But before we do so, it's important to note he's also the star of a recent tweet. ND Monogram Club just spotted at ND football alum Dan Santucci 06 at the social media headquarters on ND Day. Dan works in ND development. So without further ado, Dan, what's happening on the leaderboards? Thank you, Mark. Uh, first off, a big thank you to everyone who's participating in this special historic day for Notre Dame. Please keep giving and voting um, for the category that represents you, uh, you best. Let's take a look and give a big thanks to Not Hall. A big uh, congratulations. They beat Siegfried by 22 votes and also have cracked the top 10 in the dorm leaderboard. So big shout out to the Juggernauts. In our current dorm challenge, Lewis Hall has a close lead over Lions. Um, good luck to both of them. Um, as we look at our leaderboard, we are currently over 2,000 gifts. So that's a big mark there and over $570,000 raised. So let's keep it going, please. <laughs> big news here. And then you look at uh, the academy side of things, the law school has made a big jump over the business school, uh, currently at 3.6%. Rowing is still in a big lead um, in athletics, with fencing making a big push in the second place. And um, that's about it here for the, uh, the leaderboard. Like I said, Knott Hall has cracked the top, top 10, so congratulations to the juggernauts. Now over to Alyssa. All right. Thanks, Dan. And if you can, we're going to talk about what's coming up in the next hour. We're going to have a live performance from the Notre Dame Glee Club. We're going to have our parents hour, an interview with Dave Brenner, and another competition between O'Neill Hall and Keo Hall. I hope I pronounced that right. And that's it for here at the Social Media Command Center. Back to you.